this week at Starbase. Crews begin assembly of a new crane at the launch site to continue construction of the new launch tower. Construction also continues on Starships and Super Heavy Boosters, as well as the scrapping of Ship 26. Now let's dig into this week's update. Early on Friday morning, a new vertical storage tank arrived at Starbase. The delivery truck made a beeline for the launch complex, bringing the tank to the vaporizer units in the front of the tank farm. With two cranes already set up to lift the tank, it was maneuvered into place next to the cranes. Once the tank was hooked up to the cranes, it was raised upright and set down among the vaporizers at the orbital tank farm. The communications and lightning tower, which was knocked over during Flight 6, was straightened out. During the previous launch, at least one of the tower systems failed its automatic health checks and stopped Booster 13 from returning to the launch site. Multiple segments of a Buckner LR-11000 arrived at the launch site throughout the day, including several boom links, the derrick foot, the boom foot, and the hook block. This crane will be used to finish assembling the launch tower and is expected to help build the launch pad as well. A prefabricated concrete box, believed to be a culvert segment for carrying underground utilities, was delivered to the launch site. A new HVAC unit was installed on the roof of Star Factory. Many large units like this are needed to provide heating and cooling to the massive factory. A large section of cryopipe was almost driven out of the launch site on a trailer before the driver seemed to decide otherwise and turned around. The scrapping of Ship 26 continued in the high bay with the removal of the forward dome. Once the dome was cut off and set down, it was brought over to the scrap yard. With everything on site now, Buckter crews were busy applying the finishing touches on the crane's base ahead of derrick assembly. A trailer loaded with concrete embeds was delivered to the launch site. These embeds are set in concrete to provide a solid mounting surface for hardware to be welded or bolted onto them. The derrick foot for the Buckner LR11000 was repositioned ahead of the start of assembly work. Late in the afternoon, additional crane weights arrived. These weights are expected to go inside the crane's varia tray, counterweight tray. Back at the build site, another ring segment of Ship 26 was taken to the scrap yard. Making use of the low Saturday morning traffic, the booster transport stand was brought from Sanchez to the build site before stopping in front of Mega Bay 1. The stand didn't stay at build site for long and was soon driven out between the two Mega Bays. Booster 16's aft section rolled out of Star Factory, draped in the American flag. The aft segment, which features the liquid oxygen header tank and carries the thrust of 33 Raptor engines, spent several hours in the ring yard before being rolled into Mega Bay 1 for stacking. Back at the launch site, the derrick was quickly coming together. Once the upper parts of the segment were in place, the derrick was raised to make the lower connections. The last segment of the derrick was soon maneuvered into place. Once the part was installed and rigged, assembly of the main boom would begin. A concrete pump truck set up and began to fill one of the commodity trenches at the launch site, which helped supply the pad with propellants and pressurants. With the Buckner Crane Derrick set up and rigged, workers began to install the main boom on Sunday morning, starting with the boom foot. Once the derrick rigging was attached to the boom, the foot could be raised and successive boom links could be added to the crane. This process was repeated to add each successive segment to the Buckner crane. As a cover on the new vertical tank billowed in the wind, a 10-axle self-propelled modular transporter was brought into the launch site before heading out once more for reasons unknown. A booster ring stand was brought out of Sanchez on Monday and brought over to the ring yard before heading over to Mega Bay 1. After sunrise, one of the Block 2 Starship lifting jigs was brought over to Mega Bay 2. With the bay door now open, the bridge crane was lowered and worked on before being raised up to attach the lifting jig. Once installed, the jig was moved to the left side of the bay. The commodity trench concrete pour continued at the launch complex as the pile of earth excavated out of the flame trench continues to get larger. The ring stand was removed from Mega Bay 1 early in the afternoon and was returned to the Sanchez site. 
Large lengths of vacuum-jacketed cryogenic pipe were delivered to the launch complex. This type of pipework doesn't have a conventional insulation like most of the plumbing at Starbase. Its first use at Starbase began with the construction of the new launch tower. The ship quick disconnect arm was swung out from the tower, clearing the way to raise the chopsticks. The arms on the tower were then brought up and opened to the launch position. Pad operation teams are likely assessing the state of the tower to make sure it will pass future health checks ahead of Flight 7, which is scheduled for early next year. In the early hours of Tuesday morning, an excavator could be seen using its boom to pick up sections of cryogenic piping and move them into the commodities trench for installation. Working on a slower Tuesday, SpaceX's LR-11000 did a bit of work at the second tower site, moving equipment around at the base of the new tower. After the chopstick spent the day raised up on the tower, the ship quick disconnect arm was swung out to allow the chopsticks to lower back down. As the sun went down, the chopsticks were swung over and lowered to the ground. The ship quick disconnect arm was then swung back into place. Over at the build site, the nose cone of Ship 26 was hauled out to the high bay for scrapping. With most workers heading home for Thanksgiving, site crews took the time to do less frequent maintenance work, like washing down the entrance at the D2 gate. The booster quick disconnect system was given a checkout, cycling the hood open and closed several times in quick succession, and left closed once testing was complete. Cut up pieces of steel from Ship 26 were strapped down and shipped out of the launch site. A mystery test article consisting of a reinforced large diameter steel pipe was brought out of Star Factory on purpose built support stands and sent off to the scrapyard. A pair of forklifts were used to bring the empty stands back to Star Factory. The ship lifter inside Mega Bay 2 was set down on a work stand for some quick checkouts before being reattached to the crane and returned to duty. With workers heading home now for Thanksgiving, this marks the end of work this week at Starbase. Over at Cape Canaveral, workers had some trouble removing Falcon 9 1073 from Just Read the Instructions on Friday and removed the top hat lifting fixture from the booster. A second successful effort followed in the evening and the booster was set down on the dockside stand. Signet Warhorse 3 towed Just Read the Instructions out to sea just two hours later, ready to support the Starlink Group 12-1 launch. Support ship Doug returned to Port Canaveral on Saturday, carrying both fairing halves from the Starlink Group 6-66 mission. One of the halves set a record at 21 successful returns. SpaceX's other support ship, Bob, headed out to sea to support the Starlink Group 12-1 launch. Signet Warhorse 1 brought a short fall of Gravitas and Falcon 9 Booster 1069 back to port following the Starlink G6-66 launch, which was the booster's 20th successful mission. The booster was then lifted off a short fall of Gravitas and set down on the docks later that evening. The booster would have to wait a few days for its turn on the stand. Signet Warhorse 1 and a short fall of Gravitas went right back out to sea to keep up with SpaceX's busy launch schedule in support of the Starlink Group 6-76 launch. The Starlink Group 12-1 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 on Monday, lofting 23 Starlink satellites on Falcon 9 Booster 1080. Booster 1073 was laid down on the horizontal transporter on Tuesday, ready to make its way back to Roberts Road for refurbishment. With the stand now freed up, Booster 1069 was ready to be transferred over for stowage. In the evening, Bob returned to port with both of the fairing halves from the Starlink Group 12-1 mission. Falcon 9 Booster 1078 lifted off from Launch Complex 39A, carrying the Starlink Group 6-76 mission into orbit. Just Read the Instructions was towed back into port by Signet Warhorse 3 on Wednesday, bringing home Falcon 9 Booster 1080 following the Starlink G-12-1 mission. Booster 1080 was promptly lifted off the drone ship and set down at the dock to wait its turn on the stowage stand. As the sun began to set over Florida, just read the instructions headed out to sea once again, ready to support the Starlink Group 6-65 launch on Friday. 
Booster 1069 finished its stay at the dockside stand in the evening and was lowered onto a horizontal transporter for the journey to Roberts Road. Bob headed out to sea as well, making ready to support the Starlink 6-65 launch. Doug then returned to Port Canaveral on Thursday, successfully bringing back both fairing halves from the Starlink Group 6-76 launch. This week, the great Greg Scott took to the Florida skies, allowing us to bring you another aerial update from the Cape. All appeared quiet at NASA's Launch Complex 39B as the mobile launch platform has now returned to the Vehicle Assembly Building for stacking operations for the Artemis II mission. At the park site next to the VAB, work continues on the mobile launcher too, which will be needed for the SLS Block 1B and Block 2 variants in the future. The first sections of the base of the tower are now in place, rising from the far side of the platform. Also of note, a new crane is being assembled at this site. This appears to be the same Saren CC8800 crawler crane that departed from the launch complex at Starbase over the past two weeks. At SpaceX's historic launch complex 39A, the site has not only seen steady use for launches from the Falcon family of rockets, but is also starting to see more activity on its Starship infrastructure. In the past week or so, cranes have been seen around the chopsticks on this launch and catch tower, although it's not yet clear what they have been up to. Also, a new crane is visible next to the vertical liquid oxygen tank. Anyone have an idea what this crane is for? Knock yourself out in the comments below. A short way down the coast, Space Launch Complex 40 has been busy as SpaceX maintains a steady launch cadence from this site, including the first manned launch from this pad when Crew-9 launched back in September. Moving inland, SpaceX's Roberts Road facility has had an interesting uptick in recent activity. A new tent has been erected across the foundations that were originally for the site's first mega bay. While the tent is still empty, some familiar hardware next to it may provide a hint as to its purpose. On the east side of the structure, several pieces for the base level of a new Starship orbital launch mount can be seen. Nearby, we can also see that not only have the tower module assembly jigs arrived back at the Roberts Road facilities from Starbase, but the legs have also been installed onto the assembly embeds. This seems to indicate that SpaceX is intending to utilize these again in the near future for prefabrication of a fourth Starship launch and catch tower. Next to the tower assembly area, two used vertical tanks that were brought over to Florida following the decommissioning of the Starbase suborbital test stands tank farm are being stored. It seems likely that this equipment will see new life during the build out of future tank farms here at the Cape. Also in that same general area, the extension for the ship quick disconnect arm is still setting untouched, as it has been for almost two years now. So far, we have not seen a similar extension built for the second tower at Starbase, so it remains to be seen if this piece will eventually be used. To the northwest, the already constructed ship quick disconnect arm is also sitting, largely untouched in quite some time. It appears that this arm is still consistent with the new one being built at Starbase, so it seems likely it may eventually end up installed on a launch and catch tower here at the Cape. Moving further to the south, we can see that Blue Origin's Cape production facilities are continuing to grow. The North Campus hasn't seen a lot of change recently, but it is expected that a small addition will be added onto the site's main factory building in the near future. All around the North Campus, assorted hardware can be seen being stored outside. We can see everything from commodity tank domes to apparent testing stand components and still crated mystery components. At the southwestern corner of the Northern Campus, we can see that the door is currently off of the second stage cleaning and testing facility. Presumably this is the location of the testing anomaly experienced earlier this year and it appears that they are still in the process of repairing the building to get it back to operational status. At the southeastern corner, Blue Origin is wrapping up construction of a new large parking garage. Given the massive expansion underway at these facilities, as well as the expected rapid launch cadence Blue Origin is aiming for with their new Glenn rocket, it should come as no surprise that they will need this extra parking for employees. Nearby at the site's southern campus, several different construction projects are underway as Blue Origin looks to expand the facilities there. 
At the far south end of the site, we can see that a new parking lot has been added as well as grading work for two new structures. These two new buildings, a storage facility and a payload fairing building, are expected to combine and cover over 350,000 square feet. At the north end of the campus, construction is underway on Blue Origin's new lunar plant. This facility will be used for the production of their future Blue Moon landers that they are developing for NASA as part of the Artemis HLS program. Blue Origin is working with partners Lockheed Martin, Draper, Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee Robotics to develop the spacecraft. Next to the lunar plant, a 125,000 square foot maintenance support facility is under construction as well. After suffering some damage earlier this year from Hurricane Milton, it appears that cleanup has been completed and crews are installing new steel for the building. Moving to the south, what was originally built as the Reef Pathfinder building now appears on Blue Origin site plans as simply a light industrial building. Whatever they're using it for, however, the building looks to be completed and operational. And just to the south of this building, we can see that foundation work is underway for a new chemical processing facility. Moving down the coast to Blue Origin's Launch Complex 36, we are treated to an exciting view. The first of the company's new Glenn rocket is vertical on the launch pad ahead of its first integrated static fire testing campaign. This milestone for the program is expected in the coming days, and if all goes well, the rocket is still expected to launch before the end of the year. Up by the shuttle landing facility, the Amazon Kuiper payload processing facility looks to be nearing completion. From the outside, the building appears complete, but from the vehicles and equipment still in the area, it appears that internal fit-outs are still underway for this Project Comet facility. A Zero-G B-727 was spotted on the tarmac. This plane flies a parabolic flight plan, giving its passengers several opportunities to experience periods of simulated zero gravity on each flight. All appeared quiet at ULA's Space Launch Complex 41, but this is likely just the calm before the storm. The next Vulcan Centaur launch is expected early next year, and ULA has a healthy manifest planned for 2025. All appeared similarly quiet at Space Launch Complex 37 after ULA launched their final Delta IV heavy rocket from this pad earlier in the year. A draft environmental impact statement is expected before the end of this year, which should recommend either this complex or a new Space Launch Complex 50 just to the north for development of Starship infrastructure. If this pad is chosen, it seems likely that the current pad will be demolished to make way for a new Starship Stage Zero at the Space Force Station. And finally for this week, we'll take a quick tour through the space-related marine assets that were at Port Canaveral during the flyover. Shannon, one of SpaceX's Dragon recovery vessels, was tied to the dock awaiting the next return of a Dragon capsule from orbit. Fairing recovery vessel Bob was also caught at the docks just hours before it departed for the Starlink Group 6-65 mission. Similarly, SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions was still docked and being prepared for departure for that same Starlink launch. On the deck of the barge, we can see the Octagrabber, which SpaceX uses to secure the rockets after landing. On the dock, Falcon 9 Booster 1069 was on the dockside stand, while Booster 1080 was sitting nearby waiting its turn. In that same area, we can also see the salvaged engine section from Booster 1062 after the rocket toppled on landing earlier this year. And last but not least, Blue Origin's landing barge Jacqueline was tied to the dock, anxiously waiting its first recovery mission, hopefully next month. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update with a splash of Blue Origin brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.